Watching the award-winning RXG Exclusive, hosted by award-winning actor and award-winning filmmaker Robert X. Golfin. Well, this has been three years in the making. I'm thrilled to welcome my guest, the award-winning musical voice of this show, recording and touring artist, film and stage actor, the one and only Brian McKnight Jr., my fam. What's happening, BJ? Thanks for being here. Man, as always, man, a pleasure to talk with you, bro. And it has been it has been a while since we've been trying to do this, man. So I'm excited, man. It's great to talk to you, as usual. Well, listen, I we'll get to... appreciate that intro. <laughs> <laughs> well, absolutely. We'll get to the music, but I want to talk about this blossoming acting career of yours with a role in 2021's Love Actually Live, a multimedia concert celebration of the holiday classic. Love that film. Your feature-length debut in Note to Self, opposite Christian Keys and My Sean, to our more recent collaboration and your role of Claxton in my feature-length directorial effort, the HBCU comedy Freshman Friday. Tell me a bit about your acting journey. When were you bitten by the bug and will you be acting on stage or screen anytime soon? We've got to do something else together. Oh, without a doubt, man. Without a doubt, man. Um, yeah, it's actually really, really funny, bro, because I always wanted to get into acting. I went to, I did a bunch of auditions when I was younger and a bunch of things. It's, I was actually, I, I went out, my first real audition was to play the kid in the Soul Food series. And I think from there, man, I had always had the bug, but between, you know, basketball and then music, obviously. Um, I always assumed it would just be something I naturally found myself doing, which ended up being the case, man. Um, shout out to my brother, Christian Keys, who got me involved with Note to Self. Um, and that was an amazing experience. I mean, there was, an, there was an incredible bunch of people on that cast, man, that were OGs, in, you know, in, to a certain extent. So getting to have that hands-on experience of what happens when, you know, people say action and then what happens when they say cut was huge. Um, and then obviously, man, when we did Freshman Friday, that was probably and still the most fun I think I've had on a gig in my entire life, man. That two weeks was so huge for me, um, even aside from just the acting part. But since I never went to college and never really got that experience, that in itself was the closest I had gotten to even feel what that was like, which inevitably helped me deliver, you know, being classed man, because I, I, I really was sitting in that auditorium and watching my man deliver that speech, it, it was, I, I was able to really feel like a new student because it, that was a first for me, essentially, man. That was my first time sitting in an auditorium like that since middle school. It's going good for me. I haven't had to be out here in the seat with everybody yet. I'm ready to shoot, though. Definitely ready to shoot. You've been, fil you've been filming for how many days? This is day seven. And how, many, how many days have you shot so far? I've shot four. Four days. Four days. And real quick, your favorite part of uh, being a part of this process? Gosh, man. My favorite part of being in this process is getting to know everyone and seeing everybody come together so well and just do everything we can to pull this off for you, man. Honestly. You know, it's been the greatest learning experience for me being that this is really what I want to do now. So I'm just excited to be a part of the entire process. And in Doing Love, actually, the play was life-changing honestly because it was a huge production i mean multi-screens um singing those songs and the production itself was just amazing man and it really gave me that taste of theater almost which is really something that is a dream of mine and now a really really big dream of mine just from having that taste of it and um just recently man i was actually offered a few a few more opportunities to get back on stage and to get back behind the camera and in front of the camera. So I'm excited, man. I, I, um, I'm really looking forward to whatever happens this summer because there's some really big things in the works, some things I really can't talk about, which is always good. So I'm excited, man. And we definitely have to work. Uh, it's funny, man, because anytime I have an idea, 
anytime that now that I begin to like dabble in writing of it all, you're always the first person I think to hit up to be like, man, I need you on this with me. Um, and there's actually two really important things that we really need to talk about. So I'm glad I've got you for a second. Uh, well, I appreciate that. And, you know, you played the heck out of Claxton. That was amazing. Um, <laughs> Thank you. And that bit of soul food history, I didn't know about that. That's also amazing. Uh, could you see yourself on Broadway for six days a week? That takes a lot of stamina. You know, without a doubt, man. It's funny. I feel like I'm built for that. You know, um, I love touring. I love... I love the grind from hooping, man. I love practice. I love, you know, tournament style play. So I feel like that would just help me, man, in Broadway. And having that type of routine where I'm singing that much, I'm doing choreo that much, and I'm getting to also act and work on those chops. I mean, I would, I would literally kill for that opportunity, man. Um, that's what's so exciting about seeing the Wiz coming back. To think that there might be a chance down the line that I myself could play the Scarecrow. Shout out to my boy Avery Wilson. Um, that's motivation like no other, man. Even the Tin Man, some of those, some of those more eclectic roles. Because I really want to, I really want to get more into, you know, something with some, some, some depth, man. Because to really show off what I believe that I could do. Um, so that's really what I've been looking towards now, man. I would love to get into some classics. I would love to get into being able to deliver one of those, you know, six paragraph long monologues that allows me to kind of go through all the emotions and really show some things. I'd love to play a king or a villain of some sort, you know what I mean? So the sky's the limit, I think, on that stuff, man. And what I appreciate about acting and especially theater is that it's something I think you can age well into. I figure I'm 33 now. Um, and just looking towards my 40s, my 50s, man, I would love to do what, say, my Uncle Clifton Davis is doing, where he just continues to get these amazing roles as he gets older and stays on stage, stays on Broadway and off Broadway. And I would love to just have that be a part of my routine, man, as I, as I age in my career. It could only help, you know. I, I see it as just an amazing tool. Because, you know, doing movies is still the goal. I still want to star and score direct even at some point my own film man um especially even now with technology and the way things are going with all these new mediums even short films and short type of content i think there's just so many different ways to use all this crazy knowledge i've got of, of movies you know that I, in my head man i really grew up studying movies and, and and sitcoms really just almost as much as i i study music so um, it's always kind of been a no-brainer to me that I'll be in that field in some way, um, even as a producer as well. Well, way past time, Clifton Davis gets a Hollywood star, but I digress. Oh, yeah. uh, most folks know you as a singer, producer, recording artist. Marry your daughter among your signature hits. I'm gonna marry your daughter. Your songs have appeared in film and television series. You've worked with Legends and Next Gen. And given your lineage, it seems as if you were destined to stand before a microphone from your R&B icon father and house icon mother to uncles on both sides with albums, a grandmother that competed against the Aretha Franklin at the Apollo to a host of siblings, cousins, and other kin who also have musical gifts. I can attest to it sounding like a choir when and wherever your family is gathered. Who are just a couple of your musical inspirations and why? Ah, man. Sheesh. That's always the hardest question for me to answer because I could, it, it, I could literally run off a thousand names. But as I've tried to narrow down the list for the first time, I think in my life ever, um, as I've endeavored on this new album I'm writing for the last year, I would have to say, man, it, the, my core, maybe six or seven, um, are definitely all the Michaels. Michael Cimbello, number one. Michael Franks, Michael McDonald. Um, you got Kenny Loggins. You've got Bobby Caldwell, RIP. That was like an uncle to me. Um, and then, of course, my dad, you know. And then Fred Hammond, Marvin Winans, because there's a lot of gospel and, and when I do and when I sing, uh, those are a lot of my vocal um, influences. Um, and then newer, more modern artists, man, that I have become fans of are for sure Father John Misty, I think is probably one of the best singer songwriters and performers we have out in terms of taking a concept album to the stage and making it like a play, which is really what I want to do. And I don't know if we have anyone 
that looks like us that's doing that. Kudos to Kendrick, but I think hip hop only allows it to be interpreted by so many people. Um, and we don't have anyone that's really as universal to give them kind of a new role model for someone to step into that male role of a performer that gives you everything when you come to their show. And I think Father John Misty does that. Um, my boy Ruben Nielsen from Unknown Mortal Orchestra, I think is also one of the greatest singers, songwriters and producers of our time right now as well, um, who I definitely take a lot of cues now from as an artist and aspiring artist and as an independent artist, first and foremost. Um, and then my uncles, man, my uncle Vic is probably my favorite singer songwriter of all time. My brother is right up there with him as well. Um, my brother is my favorite singer, songwriter, rapper, artist, period of all time. Shout out to Nico. He, I mean, I mean everything he does is amazing. Um, one of the baddest guitarists out there. Oh, of all time. All, of all, I mean, people really don't know how great of a musician Nico is, but they're going to find out this summer, man. I, I promise that. Um, my mama, of course, my grand, my grandma, you know, some of my favorite voices of all time. Um, and, I, you know, it's, it's, it's funny, man, because I'm such a sponge. I'm really such a, a vacuum of everything. So that's why it's like it's I'm so influenced by you know, all of it. It's tough to always pinpoint, you know, exactly who's influencing me at the time. But that core group right there, you can always find some remnants of them in whatever I do, uh, without a doubt. Because <laughs> um, that list just, that list spans for days and days, for sure. Now, you're one of the most prolific artists. I know, dropping jams every time I blink, the collection, Love you better. I can love you better. And more than a lover. You're more than a lover. Just to name a few. You've performed all over the world, often with your baby brother Nico, as you mentioned. But if someone tried to put you in a box, they'd probably fail at the task. I think I've heard every genre there is from you, and maybe some genres that don't even yet exist. And each time, you more than excel. What's your process? And explain how you care about the sound. <laughs> you see what I did there? <laughs> yeah, I love that, man. I love that. Um, you know, it's funny, man, because this is another question that's always been hard for me. But I just recently watched an interview where Sting was asked what his process was. And I love what he said. Um, we, we, we really don't know. I think I'm still myself trying to figure out how I'm able to do what I do. I just keep doing it. And I think that's in itself maybe the process. You know, I've been making music in my home, in my bedroom, in rigs like this since I was literally nine or 10 years old and developed a passion for wanting it to be good. I wanted, I mean, I knew I was good, but really wanting to be good at getting what I heard in my head out on either paper or, 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 or on a track, putting it all together. Um, I, I think the, 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 the thing that aids whatever my process is the most is that I genuinely love writing songs and making music. I mean, it's there's and through every phase of my life, whether I was on an extreme high or an extreme low, this is the one thing that remains constant and that never lacks. Um, and I just keep going I, and I don't force it. You know, I don't force anything, any, anything that anyone has ever heard from me. You can, um, you can guarantee a hundred percent that that flew in, in the moment and that you're hearing to it. You're hearing whatever it is as close to it was as I heard it in my head. Um, of course, you know, you go back and you, you proofread and you edit, but I really don't do that much often. I think the other thing that aids my process is that, I trust my first instinct in this more than anything. You know, basketball, hooping was a close second, but I do not ever second guess myself when it comes to lines, when it comes to melodies, when it comes to anything I do. What you hear is always, honestly, always the first thing. A lot of my songs most recently and throughout my more adult life, it's been when I decide to sit down at the piano or pick up a guitar, whatever the first riff or first thing that comes through me that I play or that I sing out or a melody or a thought is usually what, I mean, the, the, the song just writes itself from then on. 
Um, the, 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 the number two most asked question I get most of the time is how I can write so fast. And I think it's because I just get out of the way. I, I luckily have been blessed with a pretty good vocabulary. You know, I, I love to read. I love to, to, to dive deep into words. I love how words connect. I love, you know, it, it's just, I mean, it's magic, you know, it really is. And I, I care for it that way to get to the care about the sound part, which is why that's the name of my company. Because I do genuinely care, me and my team, me and my boys that I write with or that I produce with, genuinely, you know, we, we cherish this, especially in this time with technology and AI, you've got everybody so scared of it. And my thing is, I, I think there will always be a genuine need for human nature to be a part of it. I don't think, um, you know, there, there's going to need to be that magic in the room. And, and there will always be a group of people, no matter where technology goes, that will appreciate those of us that are still you know, banging on the twine, uh, tickling the twines and banging on drums and doing it the old fashioned way, you know, that'll never leave. Um, so I'm hoping, man, for as long as I'm able to take breaths here, that God keeps giving me these words to write and these melodies to sing, because I don't know what I would do without it. <laughs> That's my long winded uh, version of my process. If I try to sum it up. <laughs> No, that's great. And that leads me to this next set of very easy questions. And I say so facetiously. From your perspective, <laughs> what is the state of the music industry? How do established artists stay relevant? How does new talent get noticed? How do you navigate these waters yourself? It's a completely different industry now. No, oh, man, the game has changed completely. Well, you know, I mean, it has changed for sure. But as an independent artist and as someone who has gone through every trial and error possible trying to make this happen, um, with many wins and many losses as the game goes, um, I think the biggest and most influential change about what's going on in the industry now is that you don't need the industry anymore. You don't need labels. You don't need the radio. You don't need the machine necessarily to be successful one to make money to and to gain a fan base um what social media and what these new independent artists have showed us is that if you can build your community first if you can connect with one person um and that word of mouth lead to 10 to 100 to a thousand to ten thousand and etc cetera, etc cetera, um you have all the power as the artist and if you are if you couple that with actually being good in at your art, um, and that's of course subjective to whatever you feel that is. But if you if you are giving the people something that they can feel, and that equates to having something tangible for them to not want to buy from you as an independent artist, gosh, man, the sky is literally the limit now to how successful you can be, um, because you, you you don't have to to gauge how much you give people. You don't have to gauge how often you work you don't have to gauge how much you give away you can literally set your own rules your own standards your own times um there's really a new entrepreneurial sense that comes with the artistry now that we didn't have 10 years ago 20 years ago and of course you know back in the day in the age of the most terrible contracts and just downright evil dealings that were going on and that, that still go on but you know, it, it really depends on what type of artist you want to be. If you want to be, you know, number one on Billboard and all this other stuff, if you, if you want the accolades that come with having the machine, then it's probably best that you take that route. But if you are an artist in the sense of you just want to share your gift um, and you realize your worth and that you do have the option and you do have the right to set your rates and stick by them and demand that, or not demand, but you know, incentivize people with good things and good products that allow you to flourish and survive out here in the world, um, which which we've never had, I don't think, in our time in human history. I do believe that this next five years, we have the potential to move into maybe a golden renaissance era type time in all aspects of art, music, um, movies, paintings. You know, I think the direct to consumer age for artists is here and i'm glad i'm still young enough 
but old enough as well and mature enough to realize I, I don't have to do what the young kids are doing per se. I'm not going to be out here doing TikTok dances and going crazy like that. But there is a way to build a camaraderie with my community to where it is, it's mutually beneficial for both parties. We are investing mutually. I, myself, the artist, and the, like, we're, we're, it's, a, it's so much more of a connection. And that's what I really, really love about where things are going, man. We're seeing really, really great things with some of these new independent artists that are doing it themselves and sharing the game now with everyone. I mean, I love being able to learn from these new and upcoming artists and apply it to um, what I'm trying to do while maintaining my integrity without having to sign away my publishing or anything like that. So I, I'm, I'm one of the optimistic people about where we're going, man, and what's happening right now. You know, five or six years ago, I would have given him probably a different answer. But no, nah, I think um, there's there's so much more to be gained now for and, and needing less help. You can really if you are dedicated to this and if you have the time to work for it and, and learn how to maneuver, figure out how to reach your target audience, the sky is really the limit. Um, and it's beautiful. It's beautiful to see these artists becoming successful, taking care of their families and getting out of crazy situations based solely off of their art and not having to give away anything to the big corporations. That's, that's a win, man. That's a super win for all of us. Well, BJ, you're a double girl dad. You also have a son. How has fatherhood impacted you as a man and as an artist? Wow. Fatherhood... I mean, has changed my life irre irrevocably and as a whole, you know, from the day my firstborn, my son was born, I knew one, I had to get me right. I had to give myself patience. You know, I had to learn to give myself patience with myself to understand that I had, it was going to take time. It wasn't going to just happen overnight because I'm a dad now, but I, and I had to give myself the grace to know that you, you know, you're young, you're going to have to grow in that. Now you have to do everything for this little man. And it multiplied, it, you know, exponentially as my other, my, my next two kids were born um, to just furthermore focus me and, 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 and just thrust me into that, that, that mode of, it, 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 you know, you have to get things done. You have to handle your responsibilities and you have to show up. And you have to be ready. Um, it, my awareness, all these things are just so heightened because especially now my newborn she just turned one, man, having to be so diligent and, 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 and intentional with my time. Anything I decide to do has to be important because you're taking time for my children. Anything that I want to do better be worth it because that's time I could be spending with my child. So all of that, man, it, it has really... Has what helped has what's helped formed my new routine through you know my life now, where it's like no matter what I'm going through, whether it's in career relationships or anything like that, it's really based around whatever's going on with my kids and their moms. If you know they're not involved, it's going to be hard pressed to get me to be as committed to whatever you want me to do. If I know that I can't just go make a call to my son real quick if they need me, I I, I need to be accessible to my children which is getting easier as they get older and they understand more of what daddy does. But it's always in the back of my mind that you're doing this for them, but don't get lost in I'm doing this for them to where you neglect them and to where the time that you're spending away from them is almost a double-edged sword because they know what you're doing, but then it's also like, does he not want to spend time with me? Does he not want to do this? So finding that balance between work, career, and relationships is, 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 is I mean, the, the biggest tool for discipline of all time. I'll tell you that. Because um, it continues to challenge me every day, man. As my career becomes more and more uh, prominent, as I grow as an artist, as more opportunities come my way that potentially do have you know, uh, that that can take time away from them. It only makes the time that I get to spend with them in this, uh, in these times that are, you know, that rubber band pulling back times. It's like, I find myself, you know, 
smothering them in a sense so that they just know, you know, daddy, no matter where I am, no matter what I'm doing, and no matter how big this all gets, I will always be here. And this is all for you. So, I mean, fatherhood has, it's everything to me, man. Um, I love being a dad. I love my little ones so much. I, I look at them. I look at my situation. I look at what I've been through. And it's tough not to feel like one of the luckiest guys, I think, on earth, man. To not only have, you know, to not only have the coolest job of all time, doing exactly what I love to do, and being blessed with what, what you know, what everyone says is what is what you are supposed to do here in terms of starting a legacy, having a family, starting a tribe, feeling that love, watching everyone come together. It's like it, it's tough for me to ever complain. It's tough for me to ever feel like I have failed in any way or any. Like that. I mean, anything from this point on, man, it's like a cherry on top. So that really keeps me level headed and it keeps me grounded. And I think that is another reason that allows me to always stay creative. I never have writer's block. I'm never in a rut because I, I, I just feel this constant flow of energy, man, moving me somewhere. I, and I know it's forward. It never feels stagnant and it never feels like I'm moving backwards. And my children have everything to do with keeping those engines turning. And that is for sure. Well, speaking of writing, last year around this time, you released The Player's Handbook for Finding Happiness, Volume 1, a transparent and compelling read. Tell me what inspired you to write it, what readers can expect, and when are we getting a Volume 2? Ah, man, it's, it's, thank you. Thank you actually for talking about this because it's really funny, man. I dropped that book. And I think, you know, it was one of those things, man, where I wrote it during the pandemic. My mom really inspired me because she was writing her book. My boys are my saviors and heroes. And I had gone through one of my old notebooks, which I actually have, I actually have in here somewhere, and flipped to a page where, I, you know, had to have been one of those nights. I was probably faded, just in my notebook. And I had written out the idea and I had written out the bullets for each chapter already. And literally from that night on for about two weeks, man, I just filled in what I felt almost in a journaling sense about each one of those bullet, bullet points and refined it, refined it, proofread, and then got to, got it to where I felt like it was, you know, readable. It was worth reading. Sent it to my mom. I sent it to you. And um, after y'all's feedback, man, and realizing how easy it is to get into the ebook game, to just get those things up uh, I did it I got it up there um, it's been out almost a year now literally and I don't know man I think a part of me was nervous I think a part of me was was what I, I was scared to promote it I was scared to put it out I was scared for people to know it was there um, and now I'm finally like you know I should I, I should I should let people know it's out I should I should I should start diving into it because I do think that um, not only does it give you a good insight into who I am, there are some gems in there that I think will help young men and women gain insight into what it's like to be in the mind of someone like me, an artist, um, someone who's come from an accelerated lifestyle, a, a child of a legend, all of the questions that I've ever been asked about what it's like to be Brian McKnight Jr. are in this book. Um, and it's a quick read. It's nothing that you have to read cover to cover. It's one of those things that I intended to be a coffee table book for your son, your brother, your grandpa, your dad, or anybody that could just pick up, flip to a page and get some kind of knowledge, a laugh, or, or just, just something, you know, that'll get their mind going um, when it comes to being a dad, when it comes to being a son, when it comes to being a uh, a boyfriend, husband, a brother, you know, just anything, you know, I think I, I, I tried my best to use my experiences and in my insane life, almost 32 years when I wrote it, um, on what can and will happen if you do certain things. If you want to be a player, be honest with yourself about that and everyone else around you, and chances are, your life will be a lot easier. And that is really the gist of the book. And a player, I always put in quotes because a player, we, this, is, this is a game. It's a game, you know, this game, this, this game called life. And whatever you want to be, whoever you are here, the more honest you are about who that person is, and as long as you're not hurting yourself, 
or anybody else, chances are you'll do okay. And that's really what the basis of the player's handbook for finding happiness and success is. It's just my, my, my way of starting this ongoing conversation about how it's possible for even, you know, the F boys of F boys could find their way out of that tunnel into being a decent man. And I'm not saying that means you have to get married. I'm not, that's, I'm not saying any of that. You have to be some goody two shoes. And I think that's the other side of what my handbook shows is like, I'm not telling you to be a saint. I'm just telling you to be honest about who you are. Don't form relationships with people and have them believe in your one way, but you're actually someone else, you know, double lives and all those things are real. Um, and um, I just think there's a genuine opportunity now for, you know, us to have some new role models as men. And I would love to be one of those guys, someone that you can trust to know that I've been through exactly what you've been through. I've done everything that you would want to do. And you can trust me to give you an honest opinion. And I'll never be like, you know, my book doesn't feel like I'm pointing at you and scolding you. And you know, it's like, listen, dog, I'm your brother. I get it. I get it. I may be just a little more advanced. I may just be a little more enlightened on a few issues that you're, you're curious about and let me help you not make the same mistakes that I made, or at the very least, you know, alleviate same of the, some of the pain that you may be feeling because you've already made them, and let you know that there is a way out, there is a light at the end of the tunnel, and you can become the best version of you and still have everything you want. You can still have the women, you can still have the riches, you, you can still have the career, if that's what you want. You just gotta be honest about it. That's really all it's about. That's all anyone wants, right? The truth, and what do they say? The truth hurts. But it's worth it because pain and healing are synonymous. You know, you can't have one without the other. You should probably write well, that down. You probably should. <laughs> well, BJ, you have an outspoken social media presence, particularly as it relates to politics. Now, everyone, I believe, should exercise their right to vote. However, American politics, much like our legal and justice system and a slew of other matters, is questionable and flawed on a foundational level. How do you propose people, especially members of your generation and those upcoming, like your offspring, make sense of the political landscape? Can we have positive change without anarchy? <laughs> man, you know, that is a, that is a great question, man. Because I, 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 I struggle, I struggle with the answer. Because I do believe I do believe there is a way to have positive change. But I think I think on a fundamental on a, on a fundamental level it's going to take some type of energy. And I don't think but the, I don't think it's going to take anything drastic or radical or more radical than more of us just I mean ha, being a little more curious, I would say. I I I think it's gonna take a lot of us really maybe taking a step back, doing a lot of research, and I mean deep research, and, and I feel this way about a lot of things, because you know, you can't have politics without religion. And I think those two things have become two of the most divisive tools we have as humans. And I don't know, in my heart, I feel like if more of us, you, you know, you say, we're fighting all these fights right now. We're fighting all these battles for our rights. We're fighting all these battles to be seen and heard and for everyone to have a voice. And I guess what my, well, my question now is, okay, let's imagine a world where that's over. Okay, everyone's cool, everyone's good. You know, we're, we're, we, who you're with, who you're dating, what you look like, what, we're, what your skin color is, all those things. I try to imagine what, 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 what we would be talking about if we could eradicate those things first, you know, I think research, individual self research into whatever you believe, whatever you believe, whoever you believe in, just try to acquire as much information you can from a myriad of sources before you, before you let it become, you know, so ingrained and so engraved in your DNA that you're going to fight for things that may be being used to manipulating you into fighting for them. You, it's so interesting to me how often I'll be having a conversation with someone that's so gung-ho on one of these topics, but have 
done no real research themselves on said topic, past headlines, past CNN. I'm talking about really, really getting into history, really, really getting into where these things started. I think once we have more people more concerned about what's going on with children in the world, when we finally, I don't know, as a lot of things are being lifted, the veil on a lot of things are being lifted right now. You know, there's a lot of disclosure happening on a lot of things right now, which is a double-edged sword as well, because at the same time, if we're, everyone's being so bombarded by all these different things, it can be hard for us to reach a general consensus on how to deal with them as a whole, you know? And you already know, like I could, I, I could, I could go on and on about what I believe is the reason why these things are happening. But at, essentially, I think the foundation of what will bring about the kind of change that we all want to see here is more of us having a more general knowledge of how all of this works and being able to sit at a table and have a conversation, despite our differences, despite what we believe in. What are the best ways that we can move forward as human beings? So that we can have a place to fight and bicker on over all, all these surface level things that we love to fight about so much, which is fine. That's our human nature, opinions and, 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 and subjective thinking. It's all art. I like to think of us ourselves as art pieces and we have to stop being so hard on us and we have to stop being, I guess, God, this could be controversial, but it's like we got to stop being so offended by what people think about our expression who we are and try to figure out why we're asking other humans for, for us to be noticed and for us to be realized. I think, you know, what that, what, what, what knowledge and what awareness of oneself will also do is, I, I don't know, it'll allow us to come to the table with our differences and actually develop some solutions instead of just, I, I, I don't know, there's, there's too much debating going on, I think, um, I mean, that just doesn't really lead anywhere for all of us. But I also believe that this is the first time in human history, too, as well as people are starting to feel that. I think people are starting to kind of be like, um, something's not really adding up. And, and I don't know. I see this election year coming up. I see this next three or four years, we're going to see exponential change here. And I'm just praying that it's for the best. Um, cause I do believe in us. I do believe in, 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 in us as humans, man. I think we've all been stressed for a while. I think we've been through a lot, all of us. And a lot of it is coming to a head. A lot of traumas, a lot of things that have been hidden from us are coming to light. And I don't know, man. I just, I, I, I would love to be able to have more more uh more vast conversations like really deep conversations need to be had um and i hope we get there but if we can only get there with more people being in the know man and that comes from everyone doing their own their own due diligence and their own research um because we have the power to do it we have more the power ever to do it right now which is why the powers would be distracted so much with things that they know are lower vibrational um to keep us from using these tools that we have to truly become one, to truly, you know, eradicate some of these issues that we all claim to have such issues with, but that get, you know, caught up in the hoopla of needing to either be right, needing to be heard or seen, which, you know, just stems from passion, which I understand. Um, I just want us to be able to put that passion and that that energy and that 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 hunger for for truth to go to the right places. So common misconceptions about Brian McKnight Jr. You want to set the record straight? You know, one of the one of the biggest misconceptions about me is everyone assumes that I get all of my musical talent from my dad, which is something that I, I plan on really, really touching on a lot this summer as I do my rollouts for these next couple projects I've got coming that I got it on us from both sides and everyone in my family. Oh, oh my gosh. From singing to writing to producing. Um, my dad was most definitely not the only person in my family getting it popping. Um, some of my cousins, man, especially my female cousins, are some of the best singers on earth that just don't sing, whether religion or just not wanting to be famous or just really not being what they want to do, but they just sing their asses off, you know. 
um, my mom, my grandma, my grandparents, all of them on both sides, we're all singers, we're all writers, we're all performers in their own right. My, I mean, my uncles, you know, everyone around me in some way growing up and still to this day are artists. The people I spend my majority of the time with in my family are artists, you know. Um, man, there were countless nights in North Carolina when my studio, I mean, before that, when I, nine, like 11 years old, living with my dad, I was holding the family studio sessions at the crib where there'd be 10, 15 of us in there, either writing, I'd be producing and we'd be singing. I'd be, I mean, that was my life, man, from, from nine to 23 years old of being able to have all these different people around me to pull from, even when for my stuff, either like, mom, can you sing this harmony? Or Nico, can you play this guitar for me and sing these parts? Or my cousins, you know, it was just, man, I, I was, for this to be what I believe I was born to do, God put me around the greatest cast of people to do it, which also includes my dad, of course, but it wasn't just my dad. Um, because if you really listen to my mom, if people really listen to my mom, which they will this summer when we drop her album, they'll understand that I sound like my dad, yeah, but I sing like my mom. That's what's funny. You know, I really sing like my mom and my Uncle Vic. Mr. Miracle. And my Uncle Chris. Um, so that's something I definitely will always clear the air on for the people that um hear the name see the face and hear the voice and just assume that i'm a carbon copy of that guy when really i am an amalgamation of my incredible family man and my incredible immediate family because i grew up around greats you know naturally on both sides you know um there's so many stories i could tell if i was a name dropper of the sense um just random occurrences of coming downstairs. I'll give you one, you know, coming downstairs, you wake up in the morning and Elder Barge is sitting at your piano playing all this love. Imagine that, not a dream, on a, reg on a regular Wednesday morning, I'm going to the gym to play ball. I hear someone playing the piano. I think it's my dad um, and it's Elder Barge, literally unbelievable. And that's just one of thousands of little stories I've got where I was blessed, blessed to be able to, to even to be there for a split second, to have to be around that energy. Um, and that, that's been my life, man, since I was young. One of my earliest memories um, as a baby, I'll never forget, was being in my mother's arms, watching my dad walk off stage. And I'm standing there with Whitney Houston and Bobby Brown. And Stevie Wonder is coming around the corner. And... I mean, I'm, I'm one and a half years old. I can remember this clear as day. Um, having that foundation of music, just knowledge and, and, and legend, legendary, just, I mean, prolific characters in my story, man, are all of what has fueled and is what has led me to be who I am. But it wasn't just because of one guy. It wasn't just because of one person. Now, my entire family, this is what we were here to do. We are that tribe that brings art and entertainment to the people. And I'm so thankful, man, that, um, that this is what my lineage is and that this is what I've been blessed to be a part of. And that I'm able to continue to take us to new heights, which is all I wanna do. Well, I've been trying to get the family for years to do one big album featuring everybody, but I guess one album's not enough to contain all that talent. We're working on it. We're working on it, man. That well, is BJ, for sure. what can people look forward to from you in the future? How can people support? I know you've mentioned a couple of projects, but what's next? So this summer, man, I've really, I've really got some things coming out that I'm really excited about. The full EP that my brother Howard and I, that dropped the Love You Better EP with me, um, have been working on for the last like three years. Um, and it's some of my favorite, more R, I mean, it's the most R&B, traditional R&B record I've ever done. Um, my boy Howard produces it all. I write and perform it. And um, the more, more Than a Lover album. And then I also, I signed, I signed a deal with my buddies, Third Eye Recording, 
um, for an EP, man, that I've got too, that's going to have some more original music that I'm really excited about, some things nobody's ever heard that I believe are going to usher me into my next era as whatever is going to be what Brian McKnight Jr. becomes. Um, plus, uh, I, 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 I don't know if I can talk about it yet, but there might be a movie. There might be another movie, a, a, a Christmas movie in play, um, which would be amazing. And then um, I'm supposed to be doing another play or two, man, that I'll, I'll be able to announce, I'm hoping, in the next few weeks as well. So it's going to be an incredible summer, man. I'm doing two or three residencies here in L.A., um, with my buddy Adam, the Burgundy LA. Um, so I'm super excited, man. It feels like, you know, it, it's interesting because I, I, I took a year off pretty much, man. Last, around this time last year, someone broke in my rental car and stole all my stuff, my laptop, my hard drives and everything. So it kind of put me in this place that I had never been to where I haven't really been actively making music for myself for almost a year now. I've been writing, um, but I haven't really, you know, I haven't really sat here and just made 100 songs uh, like I would usually do in a year, 150, 200 sometimes. I'm really looking forward, man. This next six months is going to be, um, I think, defining, a defining moment, not only for myself, but for my family. Um, with everything my mom has come in, with everything Nico's doing, there's just so much positive change and so much, you know, this train is really moving forward, man. And we're going to use all these things that have happened and all the madness and just everything our life has been up until this point as fuel to this fire and um, to really just show people what I've always believed we are capable of doing as a family. And that's entertaining, that's teaching, and that's just giving everyone that love and that comfort and that warmth that I think we're going to need over this next three or four years. And um, so awesome watching you um doing your thing this last few years as well bro and um winning your awards and pushing these projects out it's always amazing man you're still you know one of my favorite creators out there as well so anytime i get a chance to talk to you man and share my thoughts and do this with you is always a pleasure as well oh man i appreciate that more than you know thank you it, it's been a pleasure Sitting with my mother, ten percent beer reminiscing about the day that she met my father and how we used to be so decent back when I was made half from a preacher and half from a pimp. That's why I'm a teacher and walk with a limp. If you don't get the picture, I'll give you a glimpse. God damn it, with the vision, I see it as a gift because I know. My story won't be defeat. No, no, no. And as I grow, my glory is all on me. And that's for sure, for sure, for sure. Oh, yeah. Uh, looking at my little ones, I can hardly I was good as my brother, and he didn't have to see this. But through mistakes I've made, he'll be a leader and hold no regrets. I'm a stone cold believer, I say it with my chest. I know what I'm here to be is the best. God damn it, with the fire that fuels my quest, so I know that my story won't be defeat. Make sure to like, comment, and hit subscribe on our YouTube channel so you never miss out. RxG exclusives, hosted by Robert X. Golfin. Now play. That's right. Sacrifice has been my best friend. So my advice: stay true to the end.